Um, welcome to the John E. Miller Papers presentation. My name is Emily Weber. I'm the Operations Manager here at Briggs Library. Thank you for attending this program to remember the life and works of the respected South Dakota historian John Miller. A few announcements before we get started today. The presentation is available over Zoom thanks to technical equipment that was supported by a South Dakota Communities Council grant. Mm -hmm. And if you're sitting in the blue chair, that was supported by an American Library Association grant. <laughs> if you'd like to be notified about library events such as this, please sign up for our Friends of the Library newsletter in the back. Also, we want to acknowledge that South Dakota State University sits on the ancestral lands of the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people. Finally, we do have uh, an exhibit just outside the room here about John Miller and his works. Dr. John Miller was a prolific historian and an SDSU professor emeritus of history. He authored, edited, and reviewed numerous books and articles, mainly on history, but also on politics, creativity, literature, and small town life. His most noteworthy books include Looking for History in Highway 14, which we all have a chance to grab on our way out, the Small Town Dreams, Stories of Midwestern Boys Who Shaped America, Becoming Laura Ingalls Wilder, The Woman Behind the Legend, and Democracy's Troubles, 12 Threats to the American Ideal and How We Can Overcome Them. He also wrote the South Dakota State University a pictorial history of, from 1881 to 2006 for the SDSU's 125th anniversary in 2006. Mm. Dr. Miller received several scholarly awards, including the 2015 Midwestern History Association's Frederick Jackson Turner Award for a lifetime achievement in the field of Midwestern history. As a historian, Dr. Miller knew the value of libraries and archives. He was a great supporter of the Hilton and Briggs Library and the SDSU archives and special collections. Dr. Miller began donating his papers to the archives in 2002. His wife, Kathy, completed the process in 2021. After 20 years, the collection has grown to encompass 75 boxes of course materials, <laughs> correspondence, interviews, writings, and research materials collected and created by Dr. Miller during his career. With us today to talk about Dr. Miller's works and his influence are two of his former students who went on to become historians themselves, John Lauk and Sean Flynn. Dr. John Lauk is the past president of the Midwestern History Association. He teaches history and political science at the University of South Dakota. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> I'm always a jack right <laughs> <laughs> And he is the editor-in-chief of Middle West Review. He has authored or edited several books, including The Good Country, A History of the American Midwest, 1800 to 1900, which I believe is due to be released this November. Is that correct? You can buy advanced copies now. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Sean Flynn is a professor in the Department of History at Dakota Wesleyan University. He has written several articles and books, including Without Reservation, Benjamin Rifle, and American Indian Acculturation, much of which was researched right here in the SDSU archives. And now we'll begin the program with remarks from Dr. John Malk. Thanks, Emily. My condolences, Kathy, Tom, and uh, John talked about you all incessantly, and we talked a lot. Like, multiple times a day, multiple phone calls, constant emails. Uh, he never got into the iPhone, no texting at all. It was all email. And we transcended that boundary between old-fashioned letters and email. So uh, when I was going through some files the other day, I found an old file labeled John E. Miller, and there were lots of letters in there from, from prior to the email era. Um, I hope the archivists are saving all the John Miller emails and however you do that nowadays because there's lots of valuable material in there. Um, I wanted to uh, recognize a few people here today. President Dunn of SDSU is, is here. He knew John Miller uh, many years uh, going back. Uh, Barry is a true blue SDSU jackrabbit. He was a rancher and a farmer and has a farm now, so he's a great symbol and great leader for your institution. I also wanted to recognize another uh, John Miller student who is here in the audience today, and that is Dr. Ben Jones, 
who is now the state historian of South Dakota, following in the footsteps of, of uh, Doan Robinson and all the greats like that. But uh, Ben was here, uh, studied under John Miller, and went on to get his PhD at uh, University of Kansas. And uh, he was quick to notice his book on uh, uh, Eisenhower's invasion of Normandy is right there on the wall. So if you want to read Ben Jones's new book, take a look. Um, when Christy was talking outside about uh, how the librarians here at Briggs would collect the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and all the old magazines for John, it brought, brought back a memory because sometimes he would call me and he would say, did you see this book review in the Washington Post? I'd be like, no, no uh, what, today, yesterday? He'd be like, no, no, six weeks ago. Because <laughs> he would get the papers old and then he would clip them up. And uh, he nef never missed a beat, but sometimes he was six weeks behind. <laughs> uh, it's great to be back in Briggs. Of course, no one darkened the door of Briggs Library more than uh, John Miller, but uh, uh, I can remember first coming here as a debate researcher back in the 1980s. Again, this is all pre-internet. This is when you had to go to the library and make copies of the Atlantic and cut out the little paper and put it in your briefcase and take it to the debate. I don't know what they do nowadays if they look it up right there when they're in the debates or how that works, but there was a debate camp. Uh, that SDSU would host in the basement of Briggs Library, and that was my first association uh, with this building. And because of a John Miller research project, I actually interviewed Hilton Briggs in his office, which had to be around here somewhere, right over there. Um, and we, I did a research paper for John uh, in his South Dakota history course, and uh, you'll like this. It was on the history of the SDSU-USD rivalry. <laughs> I interviewed about 50 people and collected all these stories about jackrabbits being thrown onto the court and people keeping dead coyotes in their freezer over the winter, <laughs> throwing them on the floor. Uh, John really enjoyed those stories. But all that research took place here at Briggs Library. But the reason I mention debate is I think it's critical to understanding John Miller. Uh, John Miller uh, was a debater. Going back to Monette High School down in Missouri, that meant as a very young man he started reading Time and Life and Newsweek, um, all the things he did his entire life. But it all started in high school debate. And uh, I know one of the reasons that John took an interest in me is because I was also in debate, and he was a big fan of debaters. Mm -hmm. And not only did he debate four years in high school, but he went on to college at University of Missouri and debated four years there. Mm -hmm. So this is really where a lot of his interest in history and current affairs and politics began. And as he told me once, um, history is just looking back uh, a few decades earlier from current affairs and current political debates and, and figuring out how we got to where we are. Um, another thing that you need to understand about John Miller is that he loved baseball, <laughs> which I believe Nels Granholm uh, talked about a little bit. He loved the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, he, you know, Baseball is very historically oriented. Uh, John told me how he would buy these uh, old magazines that kept track of baseball statistics, and you would keep track of them all summer. And, and of course, he was a big fan of Stan Musial, and uh, you know, I think any if you wanted to get John going on a topic, just bring up baseball. <laughs> of course, it wasn't hard to get John going on a topic, <laughs> which was half the fun of being around. Um, Nels also talked about road trips. Um, can't emphasize that enough. He, he was an adventurous scholar. He loved to get on the road. He loved to go to a conference. And he uh, was, I don't think he ever turned me down. When I said, should we go to this conference? He's like, yes, I'll come by your house. We'll go. And uh, I think a couple months before he died, uh, we were emailing one day, I think it was the day before the Iowa caucuses in 2020, it was getting all very exciting, would Bernie Sanders defeat 
uh, Biden and Iowa and all this. And, uh, and I said, well, we should go to the caucuses and watch this. It's like, yes, I'll be down to Sioux Falls about 4 o'clock. <laughs> so we got out a map and we said, okay, let's go to Sioux Center, Iowa and watch the caucuses there. So we drove over, we took my eight-year-old son along, and uh, we watched that little caucus in Sioux Center, which Bernie Sanders did win over the Minnesota senator. Um, but we had a great time. And the whole time, John, uh, like every five minutes, would pull a note card out of his pocket, and he'd make a note of what people were saying. And I don't know where those note cards went. I'm sure they came home to Kathy, and they were filed somewhere. But they're probably in the archives here. But that, uh, that was, it was always fun to be on the road with John, because I remember one historian went with us one time, and after we got out of the car, I think we were driving down to Lawrence, Kansas or something, and the guy said to me, he's like, is every road trip like this? <laughs> I said, yeah. We cover a lot of ground, we talk about a lot of things, so it was very fun. Now, the one thing you had to keep in mind if you traveled with John, however, is that he did not like to stay in the conference hotel. <laughs> he was a bargain hunter. And, <laughs> I remember we were in Minneapolis for the OAH one time, and we stayed downtown at whatever the hotel was for the conference. And uh, John said, after we were done for the day, he said, hey, can you drop me off at uh, my hotel? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Figuring he was a couple blocks away or whatever. But no, John had picked out this bombed out Motel 6 in the red light district that we had. <laughs> it took us a half hour to find. But he said, he said, you know what, I say $40 and I'm going to buy books at the <laughs> The other thing you need to understand about John is uh, he was a small town boy. He grew up in lots of little towns around the middle uh, Midwest because his dad was a Lutheran pastor. Um, and not the, uh, you know, the light kind of Lutheran ELCA, but this, you know, the serious Missouri Senate Lutherans. And uh, he told me a lot of stories about his dad's uh, conservative uh, politics and how uh, his dad caused him to think a lot about politics. But this led to a lot of uh, John's future publications and uh, led him to maintain a strong interest in the Midwest when that was very much going against the grain in the historical profession. Uh, that was not considered a sexy topic. And, uh, but John kept the flame alive. He was, as he said, uh, a guerrilla scholar. Even if other people weren't doing these things or fields weren't developing, he would go out and he would do the research and he would find a few grants to cobble together uh, to uh, to complete his books. I think his magnum opus on that front is the book uh, Small Town Boys uh, by University Press of Kansas, uh, which came out about the time that I had a book about uh, the Midwest come out called The Lost Region. And so we did a lot of uh, one-two combo uh, conference panels and stuff about those books. And about that time, uh, John and I were involved in the creation of the Midwestern History Association because we had grown weary of the fact that there was no obvious home for scholars like us, so we made a home. Mm -hmm. And John was uh, a, a great leader in that effort, and his, he received the first annual uh, Frederick Jackson Turner Award for lifetime commitment to promoting the history of the Midwest. And I, mm -hmm. you can actually see uh, that award out here in this display case. I know John was very, uh, very touched to get that. And uh, it was awarded to him here in Briggs Library. Or no, no, it was in the Union. We were in, a, in the Union for some sort of academic conclave, and we had a nice presentation to him. Um, something else to keep in mind, John loved uh, politics and political history. His, and I'm sure this goes back to debate and the... Um, uh, the debate topics he was deeply involved in back in the day. Uh, and his dissertation at the University of Wisconsin was about um, Wisconsin politics during the Great Depression. And that was John's great interest was Roosevelt, the New Deal, and the Great Depression, and how that was managed. But that led to lots of projects that we did together. Uh, I can still remember the day over, um, excuse me, 
<clears throat> there was a day, so when John retired, I uh, was took over his classes in his office in Pugs or in uh, Scobie Hall, and so he would drop by most days and we would chat. And he stopped in one day and I said, "You're not going to believe this." The New York Times just called and they said, they asked, "How do you describe South Dakota's political scene?" <coughs> and immediately we started talking about that, and it led to an academic article we did that was published in South Dakota History in 2004, and uh, <clears throat> we decided that wasn't good enough. So we ended up doing four books of essays on South Dakota political history, which was great fun. Uh, they're called The Plains Political Tradition. Uh, the fourth volume will be published by Ben Jones here and the State Historical Society in uh, October or so. They're being released in, uh, to be timed with the election season. <clears throat> well, I'm starting to lose my voice, so I'm just going to make one last point. Uh, I don't want to pull a John Miller here and go half hour over time. <clears throat> the last thing I would want to say or maybe the last thing I'm able to say, is that John was a real intellectual. And I use that term very purposely because there are a lot of people in academia who really aren't intellectuals. They have their mind made up going in. And as John always said, he was a two-handed historian. He would weigh this evidence and that evidence and try to come up with some complete picture of what happened in the past. And some people don't do that. They have their mind made up, they've made their judgment, and they find evidence to support their theory. John was very frustrated with that kind of history, and he was very frustrated with the turn in the profession in the last couple of decades toward postmodernism and the rejection <coughs> of truth and the ability to find the truth and the rejection of uh, the hard work that is involved in finding the evidence and uh, writing the history as <coughs> accurately as possible. One last thing, um, if you want to know a lot about John's life, uh, I interviewed him in 2014, and, I, and this interview was published in the quarterly journal, published in Peer uh, by Ben Jones, called South Dakota History. I think it's online, and uh, if you want to know a lot more about uh, John's interests and how he grew up and how he came to write his books, uh, please take a look at that. Now, lastly, should I introduce the next speaker, or Emmeline, or will you do that? You can go ahead and introduce them. <laughs> okay. Well, the next speaker is my good friend, uh, Sean Flynn, professor of history at Dakota Wesleyan University, also a John Miller uh, fan, aficionado, devotee, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> and a student here at SDSU. And uh, uh, Sean has a lot of books and a lot of works that he's uh, published, but my favorite by far is a biography of that great SDSU alum, Ben Rifle, who was a Native American congressman from South Dakota in the post-war era. But uh, Sean is going to tell you a lot more about the life and times of John Miller. So please welcome Sean. Thank you, John, for your kind words of introduction. Will Professor Miller with us today? listening to John and me celebrate his life and legacy, he would remove his St. Louis Cardinal's cap, <laughs> don his historian's cap, and forthwith accuse the two of us of committing the unpardonable sin of hyperbole. <laughs> and yet nothing we say here today is an embellishment or an exaggeration. Professor Miller had a singularly profound impact on his students. Having spoken to several of his former students who attended SDSU after I graduated in 1985, I can declare with confidence that for the majority of the history majors who attended the university during John's tenure, he was our most important mentor. I'll never forget my introduction to Professor Miller. I had recently transferred to SDSU as a 24-year-old non-traditional English major <laughs> Having fulfilled my history gen ed requirement under the instruction of another fine SDSU historian, Professor Jerry Sweeney, I began entertaining the idea of switching my field of study. 
I noted in the upcoming schedule that a course in recent American history was being offered. And concluding that that was just the course I should take to satisfy my curiosity about historical studies, I enrolled, not knowing anything about the instructor, one John Miller. There were about 15 students in their seats on the first day of recent American history when Professor Miller strode confidently, commandingly, into the classroom. Now, Professor Miller would have laughed at this comparison, but his arrival to class that day reminded me of those iconic moments in television westerns when the camera focuses on the swinging wooden doors of the saloon, <laughs> through which walks the tall, imposing town marshal. <laughs> Professor Miller filled up the classroom. That was my first memory of him. He just filled the classroom. For that matter, in every setting John was in, the classroom, behind the speaker's podium at a conference or on a, on a panel at a history conference, making the rounds at a book festival, he commanded space. John's gregariousness, his vigor, his enthusiasm, his stamina affected everybody around him. Now I want to return to the recent American history class I was referencing because it best represents Professor Miller's effectiveness as an instructor. And it illustrates why he became a role model for two generations of historians. The core subject matter was controversial. America since World War II doesn't get more controversial than that. But John made it more so, <laughs> stoking our emotions and rejecting simple explanations about the origins of the Cold War or the Hiss case or Korea or McCarthyism or civil rights the Great Society, Vietnam, Watergate, etc., etc. Throughout the course, session after session, he urged us to be contentious, to be argumentative. He never said as much, but it was evident that John wanted us to appreciate that history was not for the faint-hearted. It was a contact sport. And in recent American history, John showed us how to be bare-knuckled historians. He would stake out a position from time to time, make a provocative comment, let us know, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, how he felt about a contentious historical issue, and then invited us to challenge his position. Although he rarely gave ground, truth be told, he never gave ground, <laughs> he never belittled or ridiculed a student. He respected our interpretations, or at least he respected our efforts at interpretations. Professor Miller always began class by writing, with white chalk on a blackboard, a list of terms relevant to that day's lesson. This was an important custom, because students in recent American history were, several times over the course of the semester, required to write short essays based on old magazine articles from Newsweek, Time, or the US News and World Report on the terms of their choosing. We then present our findings to the class. It made for an extremely popular undergraduate exercise, for John made us feel like authorities on the topics of our choice. I can still recall standing by my desk, he never made us come to the front of the class, he just said, stand by your desk, and instructing my fellow students about the significance of the Zoot Suit Riots, which I had never heard before <laughs> I took this class. The Battle of Iodrang and the steps President Gerald Ford took to whip inflation now. Where's President Ford when we need him? <laughs> I've summarized my memory of John Miller and recent American history because that scintillating, intensely rewarding course is one of the central reasons why I became a university professor. I was hooked. I had found my calling, my purpose in Professor John Miller's recent American history course. John became my model of the university historian, period. And if it is the case, and my history students claim that it is, that they will model their teaching after my example, which is John's example, then Professor Miller's legacy lives in my classroom, a few other college classrooms, and in dozens, if not scores, of secondary school classrooms in the region. Professor Miller was a proactive advisor and mentor. He maintained an open door policy, and he fulfilled his more conventional duties as an advisor and a registrar to his history majors. Yet the best advice I received from Professor Miller came during spontaneous conversations that occurred after class 
or when we crossed each other's paths in the library or in a campus or on a campus sidewalk somewhere. He was supportive of my plans to attend graduate school. He preferred that I attend Oklahoma State University. I went to Texas Tech University. <laughs> and he took a special interest in my summer internships with the Agricultural Heritage Museum. Following an internship in which I carried out research for an exhibit on South Dakota agriculture during the 1930s, John pressed me to present my findings to the SDSU community. I thought to myself, well, sure, whatever. We'll see if it happens. It happens. What John didn't tell me was that he would organize the event without me knowing about it. <laughs> I, learned of the, I learned of this plan, and this is a true story, as I was walking mindlessly through the student union one day and discovered, to my surprise, a bright yellow poster <laughs> with a John Miller illustration of a tractor partially covered by a sand dune. It was a John Miller original. <laughs> and an announcement emblazoned on the bill that, quote, Sean Flynn will be presenting a brown bag address on South Dakota in the dirty 30s. <laughs> Professor Miller had reserved a room in the union, urged students to attend, and on the day of the event made sure that a faculty member or two was present in the audience. I can't imagine the valuable hours that John sacrificed to make that event happen. Another example of John's dedication to students occurred when several of us history majors decided to organize a field trip to a local historic site, the Pipestone National Monument. Now, we assumed that since the field trip would occur on Saturday, Professor Miller would not be interested in going, <laughs> nor would we pressure him to go. We'd just load ourselves up in a couple of cars and chaperone ourselves on a trip to Pipestone. That was not to be the case. John insisted on going. In fact, he even volunteered to drive. It may be that one of the most overused and tired cliches in higher education is student-centered education. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Miller was student-centered before student-centered was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Miller's mentoring continued after his students graduated from SDSU. For a lucky few of us, John and me included, our mentor became our friend and a vocal supporter of our work. I believe it's safe to say that, every, that at every conference that John and I were in attendance together, he attended my presentations. Following our attendance at a Missouri Valley History Conference in Omaha in 2001, and at a time when I was still intimidated by John, he insisted that on our separate ways back home, we meet up in South Sioux City to eat at a Wendy's restaurant, and we did. If it was a small, benign gesture on John's part, it meant the world to me. A couple of years later, at a Festival of Books event in Deadwood, John insisted on taking my wife and me out to supper, just another example of those little gestures John would make that meant so much to his students. John participated in several events and conferences at Dakota Wesleyan, and once or twice a year, he traveled to Dakota Wesleyan to consult the McGovern archives. He never failed to look me up, and if I was absent from my office, he always left a note. Once or twice a year, I received a brief letter from John. Enclosed would be a newspaper clipping, <laughs> relevant to my scholarly pursuits, and in his comments, he would always pass on a compliment or a word of praise. His support was constant, and it was most valued. A couple of years ago, the Dakota Wesleyan University faculty chose to make civic engagement and revitalization a prominent theme across our gen, gen ed curriculum. When it came to adopting a book to guide us in our general education restructuring, we chose, no surprise here, John E. Miller's Democracy's Troubles, 12 Threats to the American Ideal and How We Can Overcome Them. What most impressed our working group was John's conviction that Despite the polarization, discontent, and rancor characterizing our current political climate through, and these are John's words, education, intelligence, reason, and adherence to facts and truth in all our thoughts and actions, a large group of citizens, diverse in backgrounds and goals, conflicted among themselves and how to proceed and to act, can find practical ways of achieving a good society. That quote became our working mantra, our guiding principle, and it will remain so for years to come. John spent countless hours in his library. I swear it seemed like every trip I made here to consult the rifle papers, 
John was in the library, which was wonderful because it afforded us an opportunity to catch up on everything from research to projects to family life. We talked state politics, the state of higher education, and of course, the state of the National League's Central Division. <laughs> I'm a Reds fan. John forgave me. I miss John. I miss talking shop with him. I miss getting updates on his latest history project. I miss his penetrating insights. I miss talking baseball history with him. I miss his brilliant mind. Fortunately, fittingly, the John E. Miller papers keep John present in our lives, not just as reminders of his many contributions to historical literature, but as tools and materials with which others may contribute to the, to the uh, issues and the topics that are forever linked to John. John the scholar engages us every time we read or cite his published works. The historians, young and old, who util utilize the Miller papers to publish their own works will engage with John. Their work will sustain John's voice, which will continue to be heard in future generations. For me, however, it's the voice of John the instructor that is a living thing. John's teaching voice rings in my mind, inspiring me to measure up to his high standard of teaching excellence. I was fortunate to become better acquainted with John and to count him as a professional colleague, even a fellow author. But my living memory of him is as John the ardent instructor, the riveting lecturer, the molder of young historians. That legacy is every bit as rich as his rich publishing record. It's a legacy I'll endeavor to keep alive in my recent American history course. And in all of my courses, will I, where I will encourage my students to always use an inquiring mind and to be always looking for history. And where my model of a university professor will always be Professor John Miller. <laughs> Can I add two things? <laughs> Time for my rebuttal. <laughs> Speaking of debate. No, I finally got my voice back. But there's a couple of things that should not go unsaid. Um, if you went to visit John at Scobie Hall, you would never forget his office. <laughs> it was like a bomb went off in a paper factory. <laughs> and when I interviewed him, for the South Dakota History Journal, I told the editor, Jeannie Odie, I said, we have to have a picture of John in his office. <laughs> and we found one, and it's an amazing photo. It's in South Dakota History 2014, but you got to see it. I mean, there's not a space in the office that is not covered by multiple stick notes and, uh, and clippings from somewhere or whatever, with lots of highlighting. Um, the other thing I remembered about uh, Sean was talking about walking into that course with uh, John Miller. So my first course with John Miller was the history of the United States between the world wars. And the first lecture was about the Chicago Black Sox scandal and Shoeless Joe Jackson fixing the World Series of 1919. And I remember John Miller getting down on one knee and doing the, Say it ain't so, Joe! <laughs> Say it ain't so! <laughs> the famous line from the Chicago Reporter begging Shoeless Joe to tell him that he didn't fix the World Series. One other thing that, uh, um, that Sean mentioned was uh, John was very firm in his beliefs and defended his position and used evidence, etc. One thing I wore him down on over the years, over the many decades, was the Hiss case. In the beginning, John started off as a real hater of Karl Mundt. You know, he didn't say it. John was a very nice, gentlemanly guy, but you could tell. He did not like Karl Mundt. Uh, but by the end, he was starting to come around as all these papers started to point to the fact that Hiss was actually guilty. Uh, this is a long saga that's played out in history, nerdy history circles for 40 years. But, um, but John did, did bless it on that. Um, the other thing I was going to say is uh, 
John was, uh, I would say, kind of an old-fashioned liberal, like in the sense of Paul Simon and Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Eugene McCarthy kind of liberal. And uh, those were kind of his heroes. And um, that is why it is such a great tragedy that he's never going to be able to finish the book on uh, George McGovern because it would have been great. When he moved to South Dakota in 1974, George McGovern was senator and, and John was a big fan and talked to him a lot. And I remember we were both working on McGovern-related projects. I think it was part of this four-volume history of South Dakota politics. Um, John and I were supposed to interview George McGovern over in Mitchell in his little house across from the library at Dakota Wesleyan. And so John and I pull up on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock and knock on the door, and no one comes to the door. And we're knocking, we knock on the window, we come across the door outside, and about 15 minutes after 8, here comes George McGovern shuffling out in his bathrobe, and he's like, oh, I forgot, we were supposed to talk today. Well, come on in. And he made coffee, and John and I talked to McGovern for eight hours and told more stories. And we recorded it all. There's a great transcript of, oh of this discussion. But, you know, George McGovern's political career started in 1956, went through 1980. I think John and I's discussions, I think we got through about 1960. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> but it was a good effort. Um, one other caper that John and I pulled off that must be mentioned since we're at SDSU is somehow I ended up on this lectures committee and it had X amount of money and I was telling John about this and we're both history nerds so we're like we should use this money to bring in Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And so we put all this money, I think we were supposed to bring in like three or four speakers but we just pooled it all into one and brought in Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And I remember John and I driving him back from the airport in Sioux Falls, and John and, and Artie started ganging up on me about national health insurance and why we had to have it. It was a big argument in the car. <laughs> but then we had a party at Herb Cheever's house, and Art had a few too many of the uh, Sturgis brand beers, and I had to drive him back to the hotel. But, but that was a fun that was a fun <laughs> exercise. Miller and I did it. And then John went to see him a couple times in Manhattan, up to his apartment, to interview him about McGovern stuff. Because and I'm going to join you at this point, because I, I recently found one of his little notebooks that he would keep, right, about that trip. So he stayed with Dave and me in our little apartment in New Haven, Connecticut, with our dog. Um, and uh, he had in his notebook. He he laid out his whole day in New York City, and he drew a map of Arthur Schlesinger's apartment and where where they sat and what food he fed them. It was very detailed. Is that in the archives? It is in my house. <laughs> All right, well, we need to let people go, but one last funny John Miller story. <laughs> and I asked my wife this morning, because she loved John very much, too. I said, what's your funniest John Miller story? She said, well, you got to tell this story. So I said, so one time, so we talked on the phone a lot and emailed a lot, but one time we were on the phone, and John asked me something, and I was giving an answer, probably a multi-part answer, maybe it got a little long, and there was just dead air on the other end of the phone. And I'm like, John, John, hello. He had fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's how boring my comments <laughs> Thank you to Dr. Lauk and Dr. Flynn for sharing their memories and their words. And especially thank you to John's family, Kathy, um, Anne, and Tom very much. Uh, if you would like some more information about the papers, please grab a flyer in the back. We have a, a website address and a QR code that will lead you right to the John E. Miller papers. Also, please feel free to grab some books, check out the exhibit, have some food, we'll bring out more water, and just to chat and visit with each other. Thank you. Thank you.